ASX-listed Casia Therapeutics, that's ASX KZA, is an oncology-focused biotechnology company developing innovative anti-cancer drugs. Headquartered in Sydney, Australia, Casia Therapeutics collaborates with leading scientists, clinicians and investors around the world. During a recent collaboration with Dr. Alan Olivero, formerly of Genentech, Alan shared his experiences over 25 years working in the area of groundbreaking cancer research with a real focus on designing solutions for brain cancer patients. Tell me about this background of yours because it sounds pretty cool. This is your brain child and, uh, and here we are talking about it post-retirement. Yeah, so I was classically trained as a, uh, as a chemist actually and joined Genentech uh, 25 years ago. And then I was leading projects and doing medicinal chemistry and, and then I found myself, I was at the forefront of a franchise area, it was a breaking area of, of cancer research and uh, we developed a number of drugs for that, uh, or at least uh, clinical candidates for uh, these molecules that move forward in these diseases. And then uh, I was, one of the biologists came to me and said, you know, you have some great molecules moving forward to help us in terms of lung and breast cancer and all these, but they're not going to help us in the brain cancer. You, you need to design a specific molecule for this disease of brain because most of the drugs out there don't cross the blood-brain barrier. And, and um, so we put the chemists together and we brainstormed and started making some molecules and we found out that indeed we found a great inhibitor of, the, of this pathway that's very important. It's one of the most important pathways in all of cancer, but particularly in glioblastoma, it's like 90% of the patients have some dysregulation in this pathway. And then we moved it forward and went into to the clinical trials. And, and because I lost my brother to this disease, um, I was extra motivated. It really brought awareness to the, to the whole uh, process. And so I, uh, went ahead and we, we moved it forward and uh, we're look, taking it through clinical trials as we speak right now to hopefully uh, uh, see if it actually works, but it, it's a really uh, compelling target for, from a biological perspective. So. so, I mean, my notes here, I mean, there's reference to career, publications, invention. I mean, what word do you kind of use to kind of describe yourself and, you know, what does it mean when people say, hey, look, you know, congratulations, well done, look at this outcome. Yeah, you know, I will say, you know, this whole drug discovery and development uh, effort is really a team sport. So the, the best part of all this is sharing um, these experience and stuff with your teammates. Um, but we have, we've moved several drugs forward as a team. I got to lead many of these teams, which is an extra responsibility, but uh, uh, one I was certainly willing to take. Um, and um, that's what really drives us, right? You work really hard and long hours to make something happen. Uh, and, and, and such. And so the reward is really knowing that you're doing something meaningful. It's a good way to spend uh, this short time on this earth uh, to come up with new drugs to help patients. We haven't quite closed out the where you're at and what your current relationship is to GDC0084. Yeah, well, uh, again, I probably know as much about this molecule as anybody having led the team and put a lot of time and effort in, into it. Uh, I have my own insights into the, the problem um, in terms of glioblastoma. Like I said, I lost my brother to it. I've been thinking about different ways that this can help patients. And it's, it's really about understanding all the little obstacles that get in your way and, and how to think your way through it. Um, and there's a lot of people out there that will tell you all the ways you can fail. And I'm not really impressed by any of them. It's, it's those people that help me figure out the ways to navigate these obstacles that I really value. So I know, since I've thought about it a lot, that, you know, as I, as in Kazi is now trying to understand how to move this molecule forward, I, I really want to help them think through the problem, you know, and think through the concept of how they're going to minimize the, all the, the obstacles and get to the point where they can actually succeed and help patients. So I'll give them my, what I think is my two cents, and, and hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll think about ways of, of uh, making this happen. So GDC0084 is developed for glioblastoma. It's the most common and most aggressive form of primary brain cancer. I think we all know that. What are the challenges involved in developing a drug for the disease? Yeah, so that was one of the things is so many drugs are not designed for brain cancer that, that go into brain cancer. They're designed for lung cancer or breast cancer. And so we started from scratch to design this molecule. But one of the big factors is to make sure that they're 
brain penetrant. You know the tumor is, is brain tumor. It's inside the brain. If you're not getting the drug there to the tumor, it's not going to work. And so I had this uh, saying that says, must be present to win. And so we had to design the molecules to get the drug to get into the brain. And if most people don't do that, and if, unless you do that, you're not really getting to the, the heart of the problem. I guess, you know, drugs fail. There's challenges out there in terms of getting the drug across the blood-brain barrier. Perhaps we talk through some of that and, yeah. uh, and perhaps how you uh, went about yeah. delivering that outcome. Yeah, so, you know, we had a good idea of how to make this type of inhibitor of the PI3 kinase pathway. And there are strategies for allowing to make it brain penetrant. But, you know, in, in reality, the brain, um, it's a very privileged organ. It's, it's trying to keep foreign things out. And so it actually has mechanisms to pump uh, things it doesn't want out. And most drugs, it just gets pumped out. And so we had to design the molecules not to be a substrate of these, these transporters and so they could actually get into the brain and, and get to the, the tumor. Um, so that was one factor. The microenvironment in the brain is different than a lot of other parts of the body. It has different growth factors that are signaling and, and such. And so you have to bring that into the equation. And so there's a multi-parameters of developing any drug but there's even additional ones for designing a drug for brain cancer. So what's unique about GDC 0084? What sets it apart? Well, so a lot of it has to do with the fact that we started from scratch thinking about the problem, and this is problem solving, where we said, okay, our solution problem is to solve and help brain cancer patients. And not many organizations or teams actually start from the beginning to solve that particular problem. And so we started, we figured, what, what is the most thing we needed to have a brain penetrant? We knew there's different parts of the, the PI3 kinase pathway that was important to inhibit. Um, we thought about the microenvironment of the brain. All of these came into our design, and it may be one of the first programs to really start from scratch and design a drug for brain cancer. There may be others, but I don't know. I know we met with uh, the, one of the founders of the Society of Neuro-Oncology, and he, he thought we were actually doing something very unique, trying to design a drug for brain cancer that just people hadn't done it before. Is it fair to say that it's a really tough space to, to truly understand because of where it is, what it yeah. does, yeah. and perhaps the limited access to tools, techniques, facilities? Yeah. To actually the other thing that's really inter interesting is that, you know, when I design a drug or my team designs a drug for lung cancer or breast cancer, we intentionally try not to get it into the brain. That's only an added complication. Many of the clinical trials that test drugs, they actually exclude, you know, people that have brain metastasis to the brain and lung cancer or something because it's an added complication. So you're not even getting the kind of data that you want to really help um, understand how you solve the problem. So it's actually almost the, the opposite. You actually have to think about getting the drug into the brain. And, you know, it, it took a while to convince people that that's what you really want to do. It's kind of obvious for brain cancer that you do want to do that. Uh, but uh, there's a little bit of a, uh, an effort to, or a little bit of a thought that you, maybe you don't want to do that uh, for everything else. So it's a little contrarian thought. Mm. Was, it, was it simply considered too risky? Or, or you know, was it something that was you know, almost on the too hard skew? Well, I'll tell you, because of the history of the failures in this disease, you know, some people say it's the, the graveyard of all these drugs and stuff. But, you know, for us scientists, we're trying to innovate. We're trying to push the limit. We're trying to come up with something that solves unmet medical needs. You can't run from those. So you actually have to take them head on. And um, so I, I think that's, uh, you know, it's, it's the innovative mindset of being able to get past that and, 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 and really focus in on what you want to do. So what does the current treatment of glioblastoma look like and, and why do we need a new drug for this disease? Yeah, so there's, there's some limited drugs out there to, to start with. When you're diagnosed uh, with it, it's, uh, um, you know, the prognosis is not that good. The first thing they do is try to resect the tumor. That means just surgery to remove as much as they can. They know uh, they're not getting all of it when they do it. When they, the, the tumor in a glioblastoma kind of grows out in like, almost like fingers. And the contrasting agent that they put in, the, the, they can see light up the big portion of it, and the surgeon will come in and take that portion out. But they know it's growing in, in fingers and they're leaving it a lot behind. But they still, that's probably one of the best things, the starting point is to tr try to resect the tumor. 
uh, not always possible, uh, to given it's where it is in the brain. Uh, then they'll get radiation uh, and a drug called temozolomide, um, again, for uh, a certain period of time. Um, and then after that, they give them a little break, and then they go on this temozolomide for about five days a month un until they recur. And then after that, there's a couple of drug options. Um, uh, Vastin, a Genentech drug, uh, is uh, approved in that recurrent disease. And there's another old drug where a Vastin's not approved that so they sometimes use called lumestine. So I understand the current drugs only work in about a third of patients. Yeah, so temozolomide up in, in, the, in the front line, the newly diagnosed, was originally approved, and they saw a benefit in OS and stuff. But when they actually ran trials later to figure out, um, uh, kind of dissected the patient population into this one called MGMT unmethylated promoter and methylated, they found out that two-thirds of the patients were this unmethylated uh, phenotype that and there was no survival or PFS advantage to the temozolomide. It was only working in a third. And it's those patients that are like the unmet medical need within the unmet medical need of GBM. So we think this is a really optimal place to kind of get in there and, um, and inhibit the, um, the, the, and help the patients. Um, and it sounds like that was one of the big drivers. It's like, listen, we clearly see that 60%, you know. Yeah, so, so that's when you get back to, you know, you know the, the drugs that are out there are very limited and we need more drugs. I, we'll see how this one does. I hope that others bring other drugs to the table, um, other people bring other drugs to the table so that uh, we can start figuring out how to combine and really make some bigger changes. But again, with so few drugs to play with, it's, it's hard to even imagine combinations at this thing. All the logical combinations of the old drugs have already been tried. Hmm. So in terms of future treatments, where might the competition for GDC0084 come from? Well, there's competition. I'm, I, I actually embrace whoever's trying to solve this problem. There's some stra strategic areas of cancer um, treatment now that is, are really making breakthroughs in melanoma, lung, and this is called cancer immunotherapy or immuno-oncology. Um, these are where you're getting your own immune system to, to fight the, the, the cancer. Uh, it's had great success in lung and melanoma. They've tried it in GBM, but it hasn't yet really moved the needle too much. Uh, I think there may be a possibility that, that the second or third generations of uh, uh, cancer immunotherapies uh, could hopefully open up the possibility. It's just a unique strategy. Um, for this, but so far it really hasn't really moved the needle as much as we'd all hoped, but there's great promise down the road. So talk to me about, about the potential. I mean, so the field's wide open, the science is, you know, the science has seriously got a very solid base. And clearly you can see some, you know, some fundamental pathways that are uh, perhaps tactically worth pursuing. Yeah. How big can this field be? How big can this solution be? I mean, we spoke briefly about the Yeah, so we've talked a lot about, yeah, we, well, one, we've talked about this portion of glioblastoma, but brain cancer is also, that's kind of primary brain cancer, you know, the, where it originates in the brain um, and doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really progress outside the brain. The other area of brain cancer that is what we call secondary brain cancer or brain metastases. It comes from when you have lung cancer, and then it actually ends up migrating to the brain. <coughs> and uh, this is a whole nother area of brain cancer, that, you know, that this molecule has a really good shot at helping patients there as well. It turns out um, we're doing r much better at solving problems in the systemic or peripheral part of the body, and so they're living longer. It just only gives them time to, for that little seed to get to the brain, and it's a safe haven up there. The, the drugs that we current, many of the drugs that are currently treating lung and all this, they can't get to the brain, so that it grows uh, w without any problem because there's no negative pressure on that growth. And so um, by getting a drug that's actually brain penetrant, we might be able to treat those as well as primary uh, brain cancer like glioblastoma. And you know, there's a lot of work that says this is a very compelling pathway and a target for brain mets. Maybe up to 50% of brain mets actually have some dysregulation in the PI3 kinase pathway. So it's another win there. There's another win in other areas of 
children's brain cancer and, and such too. So there's a lot of opportunity to make a difference in a lot of different types of brain cancer as well. Uh, so in your experience, how challenging is the regulatory framework for the new drug in disease such as GBM? Well, you know, I think it's a pretty straightforward trial that you would run in terms of randomization and, and all of that. I don't think there's anything complex about that. I think you can design a, a fine clinical trial that, that get the information they want for the regulatory people to, to, to see. I do think that the regulatory agencies uh, across the world are partners in, with us in, in, in this process. I, they, they know it's an unmet medical need. I think they're, they're willing to uh, look at different ways of, you know, measuring progress and, and, and such as opposed to all the classical uh, ways. So I think there's actually a, a good chance that um, you know, they're, they're, they'll help us think about this problem. And so there's, I don't see any re regulatory hurdles, the bottom line, I said. I think it's actually pretty straightforward. So how do clinicians feel about the potential for a new drug here? Is it something that attracts their interest? Are the are clinicians also on board? Oh yeah, I think, you know, again, uh, these, these neuro-oncologists say, they, they have limited options already, and again, most of the, the drugs out there were not designed for brain cancer. To, so ha to have a, a team actually come and you know, design a drug for their indication, for their patients, I think they're particularly excited about it. You know? And I think it could be, you know, if it's a success, it will show the way for others to come and, and bring uh, new drugs to their patients as well. So I think there's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm, in addition to the fact that it's a very compelling target and they all know, understand the science uh, of how this pathway is so integral in, the, in GBM. So yeah, a lot of excitement. Mm. So it's fair to say neuro-oncologists are crying out for these new treatments? By definition, they certainly are. You know, I will say when I remember going to the, the neuro-oncologist, my brother, you know, and, and when he was first diagnosed, and, and I remember looking at him, and he was saying, you have, your brother has glioblastoma. And I said, well, this was, I was a long time ago, and I said, well, of course you have something for it. And I remember looking at his eyes and realizing his, he didn't. There isn't anything out there. And I, so I think a lot of neuro-oncologists are still looking at their patients and, and trying to give them hope, uh, but they're still, um, you know, there isn't a really compelling drug out there that's going to change your life yet. Mm -hmm. Now the hope is we're all going to work really hard to find lots of drugs for those patients, but right now it's still very limited. Mm -hmm.